what really happened in the past? What's our story and how far back does our story go? And to begin, we're going to go back more than 12,000 years ago to this time known as the Younger Dryas, when ancient civilizations called it the Golden Age. It was a golden age of civilization when, you know, there's evidence we can find exclusively all over the world, which we're about to go over in a minute for anyone who's skeptical, that there was actually a global advanced megalithic civilization that once existed that was connected all around the world, not in the way where we view today with all this modern technology with cars and trains. I don't think it was like that at all. But I do think that it was a global civilization based on, you know, extensive shipping and a, a much, much more advanced understanding of our planet, the solar system, the universe, consciousness, energy, all of those things. When you start looking at what these ancient civilizations knew, the knowledge about energy and transmuting their consciousness and, and all these things we're about to go over, it really does seem like science fiction. Magic and all these things that, that a lot of us have been made to believe isn't real, when, when in fact it, it was real. And, and we've simply lost all of that over time. We've lost all of this knowledge of these ancient megalithic structures perfectly tuned to the energy ley lines of the earth and all of these means where we're coming back at this from a place where we've gone so far the other direction that most people don't even think it's real. And I want to I wanna do a quick shout out because I want to always show the appreciation for so many, other, so many other researchers and truthers that have come before me because this is not just something where someone stumbles upon all this and, and they try to get this, this, to this place all on their own. This is uh, a team effort by all of us. It's a team effort by those who are here that have the objective and the eagerness to want to find the truth and not be stumbled across by all those things that hold us back. And so I want to give a, a quick shout out to some of the most influential people that have delved into this area specifically that I think deserve the most credit. And those, um, those names, and I highly ref, uh, recommend people look into their work uh, because they deserve credit are um, researchers like Brian Forrester, Robert Schock, Graham Hancock, and Randall Carlson. You know, these men have looked at this from a, well, here were these megalithic ancient civilizations, and then here were these disasters that we can see. What happened? Is there a correlation with why so much is lost? And that's where this discussion is gonna go. We're gonna try to understand what actually was lost back then, and what did these ancient cultures know? What were some of the documents they left behind to help explain what, what has been largely um, considered nothing more than a myth and just fantasy for what has been now hundreds, if not thousands of years? Yes, I, I, I'd concur. I totally uh, agree with that. And um, um, Robert Bouval, um, Shock, all of them guys, Randall Carlson is, is a uh, top-notch geophysicist if you if you ask me <laughs> absolutely and and they and they look at this from a scientific background Reynold carlson is he's an expert in geology he understands how to look at rocks and how to look at climatology and changes and all these things that have occurred and when they team up people like Reynold carlson team up with grant hancock and then Brian Forrester comes at this from looking at the megalithic side. And then Robert Schock comes at this from looking at, you know, how were things aligned in, in places like Egypt and, and what were these, these building practices they had back then. <clears throat> and that's where I want to start. I want to start by understanding, well, what was the purpose of all this? Why are there so many sites all across the world? You know, from, we travel from South America with, in Peru and in, 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 in Bolivia and Tiwanaku. And then we go all the way up through the Americas with, you know, in Mesoamerica, you see finding the Mayans and the Aztec and the Toltec, and then going across the world to all around the Mediterranean from, you know, places near Italy down through Lebanon, um, Baalbek, Lebanon, and um, right down through Egypt, Mesopotamia, Iraq and Syria, all the way across the world into Angkor Wat, Southeast Asia, we see these megalithic civilizations all around the world. And what megalithic means is a single large stone block was cut. And they may not seem like a big deal 
at the surface, oh, you can cut a, 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 a huge stone. But the problem with that is how do you then move it? How do you move it after you've carved it and, and move it into place? And, and, and that's where so much of this mystery comes in. And so let's go to a place like, go to a place like Easter Island, where when we look at um, where they, they, they took the rocks from, they only had specific quarries where they were finding certain rocks. We go, go across the ocean, right? Nearby in South America, we see in, in Peru, what were these rocks? Were they just finding whatever stones they could and then carving them? No, in some cases, they were even going to acquire these stones, in, including places like Egypt, sometimes more than 20 miles away, sometimes more than 50 miles away, just to acquire the right amount of stone and rock. And, and, and the purpose behind that was, if you, have, if you have a type of rock that is not only far less... Um, far less erodible over time to, to actually last, but rocks that have a crystalline silica component to them, quartz, okay? This is, a, this is a major component to understand. These different granites that have large amounts of quartz in them, they are part of this entire idea of not only could you build something that withstands and lasts due to erosion, but build something that actually has the specific change on the harmonic frequency of the earth, of the energy itself. And so you would, you would pick specific types of rock that would reflect that. And that's, that's what, when, we, when you go over things like that, and the meticulousness of what these cultures did to, to build these structures and to go find specific materials for it, everything was planned. Everything was precisely planned because they knew what they were doing. And that's one of the biggest points to understand about this is that these structures are so meticulously built. And in, in some cases, we couldn't even even mimic them today or t with great difficulty that that therein lies the very purpose is that they did them you know in a, in that way for a reason because they had a specific goal in in mind and what was that goal in mind steve that goal was energy that goal was harnessing energy and allowing a place that can focus energy to then assist with things like raising human consciousness and even a thing in a situation like where you could harness energy to then use for the means of incarnation to actually be able to travel through lifetimes into different bodies because really that's what comes down to how we how we we define ourselves here it's not based on the physical body it's based on this energy it's based on this internal this internal energy that we call our spirit or soul when we do look at these civilizations all over the world, one of the things that maybe is a little bit lost with people when they're trying to put all this together to understand timelines is that there have been these different epics. I, I like to call them epics or different time periods of advanced or, or, or sophisticated human civilizations, we'll call them. But I'm gonna lump these, these epics into three different time periods. And some of those time periods are gonna cover large areas and the first time period could probably be broken out into multiple ones, but I don't think we have enough information yet to do that. And let me explain what those are. The three different time periods that we see, that we find direct evidence for, and the best evidence to show that, in my opinion, of anywhere in the world, is looking in Peru, specifically in places around Cusco, um, up through Machu Picchu, and even parts of um, coming into uh, Tiwanaku in Bolivia. Pumapunku. What you find in places like that are these three distinct different building styles. Okay. And that right there is the key to this whole puzzle. Because when you, when you look at it, you find this pre-Diluvian megalithic civilization, which was part of that global civilization that included Atlantis. All over the world, connected by these energy, energy centers, pyramids, and temples. Okay. And now, and we're going to get into this in a, coming up in a little bit, but then you had these, these cataclysms happen through a combination of things that were going on with our solar system, our sun, and these changes that were going on with the earth. You had these cataclysms, okay? And we'll get into that in a second. And those cataclysms caused that advanced, sophisticated civilization to be essentially wiped out. Now, right after that was occurring, because some of these, some of these cataclysms and these earth changes 
were, were happening over the course of hundreds of years, if not over a thousand years, okay? And what that means is that's a long time. It's a long time for things to happen. It's not like, oh, they get wiped out and boom, then nothing, and then we see this rise. There's these intermittent periods. That's what is, is the most difficult thing to understand about this that we find is that there was this, I call it the Younger Dryas civilizations, which were essentially right after the Ice Age was starting to melt from these, these cataclysms. There was an attempt during this intermittence between disaster and all these things that were happening and climate change and all these things on the planet, there was this attempt to restart civilization again. And that's when you can, when you go to Peru outside Cusco, you see this second building right next to it. This building right on top of it that's almost as big, but not quite. And it's not quite as sophisticated either. And as you go, you see this gap that, that, that takes place. And this is what I, I, I call the post-Diluvian civilizations, where a, a certain amount of time later, we don't know exactly how long. In some cases, it could be thousands of years in some places. But we saw civilization then get restarted again, but with far less of an understanding of that knowledge of the past. So in Machu Picchu, in these places around Cusco, you find the three different distinctive building practices. Practices, And Brian Forster talks about that all the time. And he's, he's spot on. And, the, and so what you find is, in Peru, we think of as the Inca are not actually what most people think. When, when Pizarro came down and conquered South America, what he was meeting were with those, the natives that he was, that he was meeting and, and talking with and then killing in many cases, he was meeting this descendants of the Inca. These, the royal Inca were actually only a small segment of the ancient Inca that were part of this royal structure who not many of them were left. And then, and that was only the descendants of what I, what I was calling the Younger Dryas civilizations. I don't think that any of the descendants of the pre-Diluvian, the real masters, were ever left. They were, we have no idea what they even looked like, but they've been depicted with beards and a lot of facial hair in which the native people of those areas don't have. So there's, there was these three different periods. And I, and I want to go back to the whole pre-Diluvian thing because... When we look at the fact that, yes, I'm going back before 12,000 years ago, but I think based, especially based on cuneiform, cuneiform tablets, looking at the Sumerian king list, one of the most incredible pieces of evidence of all, talking specifically about how Eridu was the first place that kingship was lowered to long ago, before we can even almost, even, even almost before we can wrap our heads around it, something like potentially more than 50,000 years ago maybe 100,000 years ago. We don't know, but at some point long ago, civilization was created here. It was created in the, in the Fertile Crescent of Mesopotamia, near the mouth of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. If you don't mind me cutting you off for a second, uh, I, I'm just a little curious as to your opinion on the, uh, the King's List and the, the amount of years they've each lived and, and how it progressively got less and less and what, what your okay. opinion would be on that. Yeah, that's okay. So in... We're talking, the, if any, no one's ever never read the Sumerian King List that's listening to this. I highly recommend you read it because it lists out these, these basically these pre-Diluvian kings. And, and, and that's where this, this, whole, this whole idea of, well, how far back does our time, timeline go? And the reigns that some of these kings ruled for was hundreds of years, sometimes almost a thousand years, if not more. And for us to try to incorporate that and think of it, someone was immediately, most people would say, well, that's not right. It was mistranslated. That's impossible. It's an impossible. When we look over time, go look at something like the legend, the legend of Atanya, which is another cuneiform tablet, except instead of the Sumerian king list, which represents the pre-Diluvian civilizations, meaning before the flood, this represents the post-Diluvian civilizations. And because it's, it strictly states that kingship was relowered again in the Sumerian king list to the city of Kish. And the legend of Atanya is all about Kish and this king known, whose name was Atanya there. And he was, it was mentioned that he was going to be the architect of the new world that they wanted to create out, out of all this turmoil that was occurring. Now, 
Itania, just like these other kings mentioned, like Atrahasis, who is this part of this pre-Diluvian time period, they lived for hundreds of years. And when you start looking at the different idea of, well, there was, were these the, were these root races of different humans around the planet? Some had a lot longer um, longevity where they connected back to Atlantis somehow. Is this some kind of Atlantean DNA? And I believe without a doubt that when you look at the ages of the kings specifically in these royal bloodlines, I think that they were specifically chosen for kingship like a Tanya and like, um, like Hammurabi who, who became one of these post, these post Diluvian um, rulers of Babylon. Okay. They're all these chosen rulers chosen by these beings chosen by these these great beings to rule over civilization kingship this model structure for everything in our reality for how people will rule and how laws will be set up and how the structure of everything will be designed that's what kingship is it's literally the structure to reality itself and that's why the sumerian king list says that it was first lowered to eridu which is part of this ancient timeline long ago that was then destroyed almost completely destroyed there's almost nothing left of it and then later way later it was then relowered again to kish and then atanya was the king and he had to create these architects this new architect of the new world to me it shows every single time one of these epics occurred where they tried to restart civilization after disaster less and less was given there was less of an influence over whatever those influences were which we'll talk about in the past it was less every single time and that's why we see those three different building practices in places, like, especially like Peru, where what we think of as the Inca, which aren't really the Inca, they're the descendants of the Inca. They, their building practices were, were, were still impressive in terms of what we would think of as a primitive people, but they're, nowhere, they're nothing like the megalithic civilizations that, that came before them. And you can see that in, in, go look at old pictures of even Machu Picchu one of the most popular sites in the world. When they first encountered them, that, that area, they mislabeled and, and misbuilt, put, put things back together wrong because they didn't understand that it wasn't just one civilization. It was actually two, maybe three civilizations that were actually existing there at the same time. And Steve, like you know, these sites all around the world that were focused on specific energy ley lines of the earth, focusing energy for temples and human ascension, all these things, they, they, that's the same type of understanding, this type of harnessing electromagnetic energy of the earth that Tesla figured out. And then of course his work was then suppressed and then um, hidden, hidden under the rug because so much money is, is involved in energy and, and, and technologies, you know, it's being largely controlled here, but we're just getting back to what was already understood thousands and thousands of years ago during these different human time periods. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think that you're spot on when you're talking about that less and less has come back to us. And, and I believe we're in the dawn of a new era of uh, enlightenment and we are on the front lines, brother. We're, we're returning to where we became, you know, everything returns to where it began. We're returning back to what some would call the light that we've lost in this dark period of our civilization. Um, and I want to bring up one more thing before we move on. I want to specifically talk about um, something that I haven't talked about that much that needs a lot more discussion, and that's Easter Island. Um, Easter Island, when I was a kid, going in school, we were taught that there were these, there were these people there known as the Rapa Nui, and they overfished and overcut down their trees and they eventually destroyed themselves. And that's what everyone, that's what we were taught. And the more you look at like what I just talked about in around the world, but especially in places like we can see w w whatever was left in places like Peru of these three different distinctive building practices and these three epics of humanity, di these different time periods, that's the same thing we're finding in Easter Island. And more importantly, just like in Gobekli Tepe, how it's a buried site. When you first look at these moai, these enormous figurines on Easter Island that make it so famous, it's, it's difficult to 
wrap your head around how enormous those heads are, especially when you take into account that most of those statues are actually buried underground. There are more than half of their bodies in, in many cases are still underneath the dirt. And, and so when you look at that, you, you, t you say to yourself immediately, we're talking about something ancient, something so long ago that that amount of time, people need to go look at how long it takes a soil, a layer of a, like an inch of soil to be created. We're talking about feet and feet and feet of material that such a long time period has gone by that these enormous stru structures that are sometimes well over 10, 20 feet tall were then buried by soil being built up over time. That's how ancient we're talking about. That's how old we're talking about. And these moai that uh, cover the island, there's hundreds and hundreds of them. That's unbelievable. And, and why, right? Why, why would they build all of those statues all facing the same direction for no reason? Just sim in, in a very similar light, just like we find in places like Egypt, we find these huge statue figurines looking in a certain direction. And you go over to Mexico in the Toltec site, known as the Temple of the Morning Star, we find the same thing. These figures that are looking a certain direction often have a type of handbag in their hand and they're passing knowledge. These figures from the past that are shown all over the world. I think it's, it's remnants to these, the influences that were given long ago that are lost now. And all that was, has been handed down from above that we no longer have access to any longer. And that has become a myth and is considered not even real in most of our society today. And one of those places as we transition here, Steve, is Atlantis. You know, Atlantis is one of is the most famous ancient um, society location that people talk about in the world because it's this, this idea of a perfect civilization that was then lost and um, all the different means that went into how that, that happened. But we really have hard evidence to show that it, it, was, it was very real long ago. Um, and so some of the best evidence we have for that comes out of Egypt and what used to be the land of Chem, which was specifically the pre-dynastic Egypt, which means pre-dynasty pharaohs. When I was talking about those structures all around the world, these megaliths, that includes obelisks too pyramids, obelisks, and other temples and buildings. But the obelisks, like we find in other parts of the world, were then written over by other pharaohs later on. You know, they took credit for them. The greatest, great, the great pyramid of, of Giza, known as Khufu's Pyramid, which I don't call that by. That was, a, that was Pharaoh Khufu that tried to take credit for that entire structure, even though he had nothing to do with it. He was just a king that came later in these, during these, these dynastic kings of Egypt, these pharaohs that then tried to take credit for the, the civilizations before them. And it was largely misinterpreted, if on purpose at all, by those who first found the sites when they were uncovering them. And so there was so much of our history that became confused because of the different time periods and epics that happened. And so getting into Atlantis, this, we have this famous... Um, famous being named Thoth who left all these writings back behind because he was this priest of Atlantis who then left during the destruction and went to what was what became uh, later Egypt which was the land of Chem and he was this priest there that then created all the pyramids and the structures there and was booted out later when they changed um, calendars from from a from a lunar to a solar calendar when which he then went to Mexico and became Kukulkan and Quetzalcoatl but the point is, we have this ancient civilization known as Atlantis that Thoth gives us specific details about. He tells us all about the different principal islands. He says there was seven circular islands that, that surrounded a central island that, that, um, in which there was this famous city called Kior on this island known as Undal in, the, in which he was born and he came from. Or in, during that current incarnation, he says which is a very important key point to bring up about this whole idea of, of incarnations. Um, and then if reading into the different ancient history of Atlantis and the, dif the different things that happened there, you learn about this battle that was going on between Poseidon and Zeus and how there's these really um, 
there's this battle that occurred called the Titans versus the Olympians, where the Olympians being led by Zeus ended up destroying the Titans and took over and created the, the archetype for the new world. I mean, that, I think that was a real aspect of looking of what occurred symbolically back in history with this changing of power over between these different groups around the world and subsequently the disasters that then destroyed them. Um, and specifically Atlantis is not, it's not, it doesn't actually sink into the ocean as, as, as Plato um, described. A lot of it is a, a symbolic metaphorical way to talk about it. When we look at um, how, when, during the Younger Dryas period when these disasters were occurring, where ocean levels were rising 400 feet to where they are now, that's how something could essentially be looked at as sinking into the ocean. If you're having ocean levels that are ri rising by 400 feet, you would essentially lose um, those structures, anything that's built at a certain level close to, to, to uh, sea level. And it makes sense that if we're taking what Plato said, where he says Atlantis was destroyed 11,600 years ago, it's fascinating to go see that you see correlation where Gobekli Tepe, which is a site in Turkey, was supposedly created 11,600 years ago, exactly the same date. Now, why is that important? Well, when Atlantis was being destroyed and a lot of these cataclysms were, were happening, we have overwhelming evidence from not only Thoth in talking about Egypt, but a lot of other places where this knowledge from Atlantis was then brought to different places of the world, specifically in Egypt and in a lot of places around Turkey and the Mediterranean. But it's specifically, we can see it in a couple places where it just really stands out. And that, that site to me is Gobekli Tepe. Because when you look at the site, you dig down and you look at the archaeological evidence of what was there, pottery, people, how they lived, you know, was it nomadic tribes? What was it? You find that we yes there were nomadic tribes there but all of a sudden it went from nomadic tribes to extensive agriculture and the building of this in, in, in huge site in almost no time at all rather than having this gradual buildup of what we think of how civilizations got there we saw this jump start out of nowhere at the same time that atlantis was being destroyed just as we're told that Chem, this land of Egypt, was was also being built and created based on all this dissemination of information that was coming out of the destruction of one of these, you could call it the greatest um, gathering of information ever in history, Atlantis. It was the place where records of, of all of time of Earth's history were kept. And when it was destroyed by, we're going to talk about in a minute, we find that out in the Atlantic Ridge, where it was supposedly was, Plato says in the Timaeus and Critias that it was found west of the Pillars of Hercules. We know that the Pillars of Hercules is the Straits of Gibraltar. And just like we, if you look west of there, you find the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, okay? That makes all the sense in the world if you think about when, if there was violent earth changes where ocean levels were violently changing and volcanic events were occurring and um, tsunamis and all of these devastating things were happening, the, if you were on a ridge where that pressure was being released, it would be the most dangerous place to be at all, of all. And that's why Atlantis was completely destroyed and it took, other, it took time for other places to succumb to things like the violent changes in the climate and a lot of other, other, other things that were occurring during that time period. So you saw these migrations of these civilizations to other civilizations like Gobekli Tepe in Mesopotamia, where they were creating and attempting to restart all of these civilizations that were then lost again later. And then we look back at them and we, we think it's impossible, but it really wasn't impossible. We just, it's hard for us to wrap our heads around it. That evidence that talks about what happened, we can find that evidence directly. Go look at ice core samples from Greenland which is a snapshot of our atmosphere and our climate at that time, we can see that, wow, look at this, during the Younger Dryas period, right when our ice age, the ice age was, was violently ending and, and all the ice was melting, here we have temperatures shooting up beyond anything we see in our climatological records, then plummeting and then rising up again, all in the, in the, in the, over the span of about 800 years. These incredibly violent changes that were occurring on the earth 
And if you in civil, and that's what makes it even more difficult to comprehend. Look at some of these sites in Bolivia, Tiwanaku. They're found at such a high elevation that trees can't even grow there. And yet they were still wiped out too. So we're not talking about just water here. We're talking about such a violent change that was occurring with the earth during, during this younger Dryas time period that it was enough to destroy civilizations that were so advanced that they understood the balance of nature perfectly. They understood agricultural practices precisely, how to grow things in, in the climates that they were in. They understood how to harvest things correctly, and yet they were still wiped out. That's why we need to look now, look at today. Most people today could never even survive in the outdoors for more than a couple days. What would happen if we had something as simple as just knocking out the power grid to the world? It would be, we would be thrown right back into the Stone Age because we've been so, we become so dependent on technology that we've lost our way with understanding how to be balanced with the world around us. And that's why when you read a lot of these ancient writings on how to reach higher states of consciousness, you find that it's essential. And I mean that, I wanna repeat that, it's essential that you understand and go back to your roots of your place on this earth and, and with the animals and plants around it and your place in the solar system and the stars. What is your place here? Are you, are you in the survival of the fittest mentality where you're just taking whatever you want and destroying whatever you want around you with no repercussions? Is that how the human race should act, especially given what we are in our history? Or have we just gone down a dark road where we're at the same, same place where some other civilizations have been where they were destroyed and lost? I think there's a lot of lessons that, that can be learned from looking at reading the Adrahasis and what they say specifically happened with these disasters that occurred, reading the Epic of Gilgamesh, read the Sumerian King List, read the Legend of Atanya, the stories of the Hopi and in the Bible about what happened, where all these things were lost before. And we're just regaining those things now. Um, and so that's why Atlantis is so important, because it represents this central city hub, I think, of, the, of what the world was at the time. We think maybe today of a place like London or New York City or all these different places as being is the commerce center or the capital of our world. I think Atlantis acted as that for all these ancient megalithic civilizations. And so that's why it's so important that we then take into account of what Plato said and what these ley lines were connecting these civilizations all over the world. Why were they all found on these convergence of energy? Is that just a coincidence? Or is that a piece of the puzzle for us to understand these structures? And so to do that, to understand the past, to understand what happened that we're missing, we have to understand what Thoth said, which was, remember, he's, he was one of the main priests of Atlantis. He had all the knowledge of Atlantis. He's the one who jump-started e Egypt, which was called Kemp. And he's the one who then influenced, um, or at least one of the incarnations of, that helped influence you know, the Maya and the Aztec and a lot of these ancient cultures around the world. So to find out the answers, we have to read from what he left behind. And that was called the Emerald Tablets. Okay, and this was then carried over to later Hermetic writings were, were written by Hermes, which I believe was also an incarnation. As, as, as crazy as that may sound to some people, Read what he says about his different incarnations and about how he essentially mastered reality in terms of instead of having to die and losing almost everything you know and having to start over, what if you didn't? What if you could transmute your consciousness into another body and then re have all of your memories and experiences and knowledge retained into that next body? The fact that you, what you just stated right there, I remember back when, I don't know, just a few years ago where reincarnation was enough. Well, recently I've come to realize that you can free yourself even from that through, through a process of uh, enlightenment by looking inside, which is called the divine union. But there is, like you said, there is a way to hold on to your consciousness so you can, so today can live on through time into the days of tomorrow. And that's right. It's, it's stated in the tablets over and over again. 
That's right. And we're going we're gonna to get into that specifically is how can you get, a, get beyond the system that's here? This system of incarnation. Is it possible for you to not be incarnated again? As hard as that is to try to wrap your head around, what if you, in this lifetime, you were able to do certain things and accomplish certain things, both eternally and outwardly, where you could somehow ascend and become a different form of energy where you wouldn't have to come repeat this over and over again? And that's what this, I, I believe that this experience we're having really is, is it's a place where people are supposed to grow and, and learn. Specifically states that, talks about how he, you know, where he came from and how he basically rose ab above and beyond that cycle to become what he is now. And so I want to begin by reading Emerald Tablet number one. I, though the Atlantean, master of mysteries, keeper of records, mighty king magician living from generation to generation being about to pass into the halls of amente set down for the guidance of those who are to come after these mighty of the mighty wisdom of great atlantis in the great city of kior on the island of undal in a time far past i began this incarnation not as the little men of the present age did the mighty ones of atlantis live and die but rather from aeon to aeon did they renew their life in the halls of Amente, where the river of life flows eternally onward. A hundred times ten have I descended the dark way that led into light. And as many times have I ascended from the darkness into the light, my strength and power renewed. Now for a time I descend, and the men of Chem shall know me no more. But in a time yet unborn, I will rise again, mighty and potent, acquiring an accounting of those who left behind me. Then beware. If ye have falsely betrayed my teaching, for I shall cast ye down from your high estate, into the darkness of the caves from whence you came. Betray not my secrets to the men of the north, or the men of the south, lest my cure, curse fall upon ye. Remember and heed my words, for surely will I return again, and require of thee that which ye guard, even from beyond time and beyond death will I return, rewarding or punishing, as ye have re repeated your trust. Great were my people in the ancient days, great beyond the conception of the little people now around me, knowing the wisdom of old, seeking far within the heart of infinity, knowledge that belonged to earth's youth. Wise were we the wisdom of the children of light who dwell among us. Strong were we the power drawn from the eternal fire. And all of these, greatest among the children of men, was my father, Thothme, keeper of the great temple, link between the children of light, who dwelt within the temple of the races of men who inhabited the ten islands. One of the things that's so difficult about this, much like many other ancient writings as well, is that they've actually been specifically written in many cases so that the information within them will only be able to be revealed by those who are truly supposed to understand it because of their studying, and they're looking at understanding symbolically what was supposed to be said long ago. So a lot of this was written in parables and metaphors and hidden within symbolic represent representations. However, not everything is, in my opinion, is purely just symbolic. I think that one of the ways that they loved to write back then was so that they could both represent something on a linear level and on a non-linear level at the same time. That's the brilliance behind their work. And so I want to, I just want to bring up really quickly what he says specifically was that when he's writing this, he's actually writing it from the perspective of in Egypt. He says he's writing it when he was in Chem. So this is his knowledge he left behind when he left Atlantis. So he's in Chem and he's about to go into one of his cycle changes where he's going to go rest and then incarnate to, into another body. And he's leaving this message behind before he does. And that's what's so amazing about it. And he says specifically that his father of Atlantis, the keeper of the great temple, Thothme, was the link between the children of light who dealt in the temple and the races of men, okay, or who, who resided on the 10 islands of the world. That is a fascinating thing to wrap your head around because it means basically that who he states are these children of light, these ancient ones, these ancient beings that, that I believe are the ones who were, had given this knowledge down long ago. 
they were only accessible by those who were part of these pyramid priests and these sages in these great temples. And the rest of society had no access to them or their knowledge. And I think that's one of the ways and one of the reasons why they've, they've been considered just a myth and not real. Because so much time has gone by that we have this whole idea of incarnation, but before that, we had this idea of disseminating knowledge. And the question is, where did that come from? How could you just find this rise of civilization that comes out of nowhere if it wasn't based on something that influenced them? We are here at this time period where it, we're going to have to decide what this path is going to be ahead of us. Will we understand and separate this physical body from our eternal energy? Or are we going to keep focusing on this, this Ka world, which is the physical world, this physical world that binds us? All of these teachings of wisdom coming into play where we can finally ascend beyond this and really reach what we were supposed to all along, which is higher states of energy and awareness of the universe and the purpose we have within that. And I want to just make a quick mention is on my new, the new website I've made called thestageoftime.com. I added, um, it doesn't show it in the screenshot, but I added a whole page that covers a, a good amount of ancient writings, including the Atrahasis and the Numa Elish. And the rest of them will be, will be in the stage of time, the book once it releases. But for now, those who want to have um, a, a place where the most accurate translations from experts like Stephanie Daly and George Smith, they can go to my website and go to ancient writings and have those present for whenever they want to read them. As well as, pl please check out my, uh, my YouTube page at Matthew LaCroix. And, and Steve's got a great um, YouTube page. Steve, go ahead and call out your YouTube page too. Well, it's just a slightly slanted sleuth for the truth. And it, it is what it is. And it's, that's all I'm after is the truth, the big T, uh, the monad of everything. And that's what I think we're both after. And that's why I commend you, sir. Thanks, Steve. And ha have a great day. And I, I appreciate um, all your support, my friend, and everyone else that supports us.